Hi, I'm Tracy McDaniel. At Choose New Jersey, we work to attract jobs and businesses to our state by promoting New Jersey's world-class advantages for companies big and small. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by AmeriHealth Caritas, parent company of Perform Care. Care is the heart of our work. TD Bank, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. NJM, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability. Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. And by Community Education Centers. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce, for the first time on One on One, <laughs> Stacey Antine, the founder of Health Barn USA and the director of the Health Barn Foundation, which is? Well, which is, which is a giving back to the community. Health Barn, Health Barn USA is dedicated to educating kids and their families. And Health Barn Foundation, we're starting a new program called Healing Meals. Um, which I, is, do you mind if I plug your book? Yeah. <laughs> Tell everyone what this book, Appetite for Life. Bob, get a shot of this. <laughs> you already have it. Um, tell everyone what this is all about. Well, this is, is sort of like a, it's a gift for all families that you know are, are looking for good ways to get their kids to eat healthy, get excited about living a healthy lifestyle. So there's a hundred recipes in there, and then it, it's it's basically the best of Health Barn. I wrote it for parents to be facilitators of the process instead of the food police. I that? have <laughs> failed at this. <laughs> I have failed. I'm you admitting. can never fail at this. Well, I have failed so far. Okay. Um, we have three younger children. And I, I just, I always thought that if, if I did the right thing, my wife and I did the right thing, then our kids would go, oh, so you don't eat really bad stuff or too, too often. Right. But it doesn't always work that way. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of influences today. There's schools, there's peer pressure. <laughs> I hear this all the time, like my kid was such a great eater until they went to kindergarten. You know, and it's just what people don't realize is that, you know, food is values. So just like you say, oh, food is values. Yeah, I Explain mean, that. I, I think that values in the sense that how we feed ourselves, what we eat is, is based on our values. And so um, if you think about, you know, reckless driver with your children, if, if there is a parent that rides around without seatbelts, would you put your child in the car? Good point. And so if you're, um, if you're really into healthy food and you think this is really important for the, for the life of your child, you know, why is it okay for, for you to hang out with parents that you know, go to Dunkin' Donuts all the time or constantly whip out the chicken nuggets when, you know, when there's nothing else in the, to cook with? So I think, I think basically you, know, you are what your friends are and you have to really think about this and, and the influences that have it on your children. But I like how you said you don't want to be the food police because I feel like that too. <laughs> Um, why don't we do this, Stacey? Let's take a look at this video, which talks about uh, Health Barn USA, and we'll come back and talk. Health Barn USA on video. There are a lot of myths around kids eating healthy, and a lot of grown-ups don't believe that kids will eat healthy, and we prove it every day that that's not the case. And 30,000 kids later, it's definitely not the case. Our hands-on approach that's outlined in Appetite for Life gives kids and families the tools they need to make healthier choices. So when they're out there in the world and they're getting bombarded with all the junk food advertising and all these influences, whether they're at a play date or in the school cafeteria getting teased about healthier lunch options like carrots instead of chips, they have the power and the knowledge and their advocates for the way that they've chosen is better. Wow. What made you produce that video? Oh, well, I mean, I was trying to get the message out because sometimes the idea of Health Barn, people don't really get. They think it's for, for kids that have weight problems, but I mean, the way we're living today, and if you look at the health of our society, everybody could benefit from learning how to eat. 
and there's just so many people and so many influencers trying to educate people, but it's mostly uh, people selling their products, so you can't really learn it that way. What triggered you to start this organization? Well, I was working in PR for the big food companies. I call it the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> you don't call it the dark side, do you? <laughs> A lot of people do. Uh, but then I started doing my internship at, the, at Beth Israel Hospital. I was doing right. my master's in dietetics at NYU, and I did my, my internship, and I saw what was happening. Kids were getting treated for being overweight. And then I saw that stat, I don't know if you've ever seen it, that this is the first generation of children that won't outlive their parents based mm. on lifestyle. And I was just outraged. And I, I just thought, wow, you know, seeing it in the hospital, I thought, you know, we're really going about it in the wrong way from a treatment standpoint, when really it's a matter of education. I mean, you know, we need to teach kids that the big gold soda isn't a good choice. But if they don't know it, how could they make a good choice? So I just felt like at least plant the seeds with children, give them a chance. Without any education on this topic, they don't have a chance. So if people go on the website, we have it up right now, the Health Barn USA website, what do they find, what do they get? Uh, well, we actually offer programs. So the great thing about Health Barn is that we are located at Admas Farm in Wyckoff, New Jersey, and we run programs for ages 3 to 12, and they grow their own food, they learn about how to cook, they learn about why it's good for their bodies. Uh, we do school and scout field trips, we do assemblies, so we are actually mobile. I've done assemblies all over the country, actually, California, Pennsylvania, tons in New Jersey. Right. And then um, the great thing, that's why with Appetite for Life, if you can't get to the farm, right. you can buy the book, Appetite Brother, what for Life. What do you grow life. at the farm? Sorry for interrupting. What do you grow at the farm? Oh, I mean, everything kids love to eat. Carrots. We have a super salad bar. They love to pick their carrots. We have daikon radishes for their miso soup because radishes are super cool to pick. Um, tomatoes, broccoli, chamomile. We have a huge chamomile tea garden. We teach them to actually, because a lot of kids have sleeping problems. So even harvesting the chamomile, zucchini, and the mean, kids are raspberries. Totally, kids are totally involved. Completely, like start to finish. They don't make the food. Yeah. No, they don't. They do. We have in the barn. They cook their own food. We have. Get them, out of we, there's a hundred recipes in there. The kids can. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday we made homemade raviolis. It was like the greatest thing since sliced breads for kids. Like they were just. And like, who are the people who sign up? What kind of people? Uh, it's an interesting mix of people. It's parents that actually live this lifestyle and want their children to hear it from somewhere else. We get a lot of picky eaters. We oh, get <laughs> <laughs> really picky yeah. eaters. We get a lot of picky eaters that really change their mind because a lot of the time it's control and it's part of their personalities. They get a lot of attention that way. So if they if they start to realize that oh this is cool and now it's my idea and I'm coming to the parent and the parent just has to say oh this is a great idea let's make this recipe. Mm. Um, it just changes the, the control aspect. And then we have, like, it's really interesting, we'll have some parents that maybe had a health issue in the family or there was a family member that had a health issue and now they want to change the way the family eats and they're right. committed to it. So we, I learn about those stories as they go on. But for the most part, I mean, again, it's a value. Every single child that's in that health barn and the families, because we really treat the whole family, is, is really committed to this. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not a recreational activity. It's really something they're, they're it's dedicated. Yeah, and it's important. And the walk away message here, because by the way, the foundation. Yeah, the foundation, I just, we just started that, and it's a, an amazing partnership uh, with the Meals with a Mission. It's a nonprofit commercial kitchen where we cook the meals. There's 10 meals out of Appetite for Life. The Bergen Academy culinary students make the meals. We actually ship it to um, Tomorrow's Children's Fund in Hackensack. Right. When the children come out of their cancer treatment with their families, the, the social workers give them a menu. They, get, they choose whatever it's healing meal they want, frozen. We do it fresh. Whole Foods provides all the ingredients. It's been so successful so far, they've had to install a second freezer. And you're running the business with your team. And we, well, th thank God for this partnership for Healing Meals and then Health Barn, I'm, t you know, full time. You love this. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's my passion. life. It's my passion, yeah. It is I live it. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I can't imagine doing anything else. Well, I don't know how we found you, but I'm glad we did. I think oh, we found you through you. our friends at Hackensack University Medical Center. Was it? Yeah, I yeah, don't that's know. Good stuff. I that's how, <laughs> see, that's how good word yeah, gets exactly. around. Yeah, exactly. It's all uh, connected. Stacey Antine, founder of Health Barn USA, director of the Health Barn Foundation. I want to thank you for joining us. and sharing the good word. Thank you, Steve. Good stuff. One-on-one -on -one will continue right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, 
Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Georgine Theodore is associate professor at NJIT and also principal, Interborough Partners. Good to have you with us. Nice to be here. Um, you're an architect and urban designer by background. You study some fascinating things, particularly at a time post Hurricane Sandy. Mm -hmm. People think, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. I bet you believe it happened, right? Yes. Because? Well, the world is changing. Um, we have an incredible increase in these extreme weather events. Um, we have sea level rise. And then we also have an unsustainable pattern of urbanization that really has affected the way that water moves. And um, that's put a lot of communities at risk. So what impact does that have on the work that urban planners do, that architects do, mm -hmm. in terms of what is built, how it is built, mm -hmm. and how, it's, how it needs to be built to protect the rest of us? Yeah. Well, a question, I know. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's a very exciting time to be um, an architect who's dealing with large-scale design issues because these, um, these challenges that we're talking about, they're very, very complex, and there's not just one silver bullet solution. It's not like you can just put, you know, gates um, along the bay mm -hmm. and then everyone is going to be safe. And so um, I think that right now it really requires um, a certain type of thinking that is systems-based that allows us to sort of look at the complexity of all of these different um, urban systems working together in relationship to these major um, climate change issues. I know that, that, so uh, that sounds fascinating, but break it down from okay. a more um, practical example, because mm -hmm. I, I will tell you that post-Hurricane Sandy, mm -hmm. you know, I, I said, oh, wow, look, it just means that I guess you're not supposed to develop mm -hmm. in certain parts of the world or the state. If you, you know. But then I turned around and I said, you know, we, without going into a lot of detail, we're building down at the Jersey Shore mm -hmm. a home. And I said, well, you go really high. Mm -hmm. But it's not that simple. Right. Because then I thought, well, maybe we're not supposed to be here. Right. Maybe you're just not supposed to build businesses and homes in certain places. Yeah. Is it that simple? It's, um, it's not that simple because we have hundreds of thousands of people that are living in very vulnerable areas, and we can't just leave those places immediately, although the long-term prospects... We? Um, Should we be saying, you know what, there's a whole bunch of places we shouldn't have been building, and we can't get you out of there right away, but long-term, we're going to get you out of there, mm -hmm. and we're going to say you can't build there. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people who say that, and I think it's reasonable to say that kind of thing. But when you talk to people who have their homes in these areas and they have their memories, it's um, very hard to imagine an immediate retreat. Um, the work that I've been doing with my partners um, at Interboro Partners in New York um, as part of the Rebuild by Design um, initiative is we've actually been looking at a large number of these areas, these communities in our region, where there is a very sort of, um, there are a lot of people who live there, they have their homes, and we're looking, uh, to, we have developed strategies that um, uh, for the sort of the short term will allow the, these communities to adapt. Give me one example. Um, well, um, we just received um, a, a project, a initiative that we had developed has just received funding from uh, HUD um, to... Housing and urban... Yes. Federal government. Yes. The, Housing and urban development comes yeah. in and says, here's money to do what? Well, we are working um, on the Mill River, um, which is a tributary river that sort of goes north-south and empties into a bay. And what we found is that the communities along the bay are... What are we looking at right there? Uh, that picture yes, right there. Yes, exactly, right. Um, it's um, a community that was really, really hard hit during the storm. And many of the homes along this water's edge were, um, were inundated, many were destroyed. And what we discovered um, with the, our team, uh, which is a combination of architects, um, planners, uh, hydrologists, water engineers, was that the, um, the communities that are along these bays and along these rivers, they're vulnerable because storms come in and the water rises, but also they're vulnerable because 
um, sea level is rising, but they're also vulnerable because these tributaries are where all of the urban stormwater comes down from the sort of the developed regions. And so you're in a situation where you have multiple threats. Um, they have to do with sea level rise, with storms, but also with the management of urban water. And on top of that, you have major degradation of these sort of um, these water channels because the water's not filtered and the right. water that comes across the land sort of moves down the river and gets dumped directly so into the bay. So what should we be doing? Well, there, what we've proposed is to have a series of interventions. One is to have a series of sluices that are gates, tidal gates, so that when a storm comes and the, the surge pushes up, the gate can be closed. And so the communities that are sort of on the upland side are protected. But that's not enough. And we're also looking to increase the water retention, um, uh, increase water retention along the river's edge. And we can do that in a way that is um, not only dealing with the water, have pools that sort of hold the water so mm. that it doesn't move upland, but you can also do it in a way that it enhances the, the quality of everyday life. You can sort of increase the recreational value of those, of those areas. And finally, um, we're also looking further upland and increasing sort of um, uh, uh, introducing stormwater management um, measures, which are like, say, rain gardens or um, bioswales. These are. What's a bioswale? A bioswale, well, yeah. Am I using too many technical terms? Well, it is hard to yeah. follow. Okay. And so it's not a question of too many, but a bioswale is. A bioswale um, is like a, um, a bed, a sort of a, a planted bed that could be along a sidewalk or a street that is planted, so it's very, it can be very attractive. But what it does is that when you have a major rain event, instead of having all of the water rush off all of the parking lots and the driveways and the streets and overwhelm the stormwater system and go directly into the rivers. Is what that this what we're is, looking at right there? Yes, exactly. See? Um, right. And so what you see is that there's a, um, there's a, uh, like a kind of a bed that uh, can hold water during these events, and it slows the water down. And that's what the, this large this project, um, the images that you've shown, we call it sort of slow streams because it's about slowing the water down, slowing the water when it sort of um, when it moves in on the storm, but also slowing the water when it comes down. So quickly, the work that you're doing mm -hmm. is largely about realizing that these changes mm -hmm. in the climate. It's only going to get more challenging for us, and mm -hmm. if we don't prepare for them, we're going to experience more devastation. Right. We've got to do these things. Yes, we have to, and that's why, um, you know, uh, Rebuild by Design, which was this initiative that was started by the president and then spearheaded by the secretary, Sean Donovan, it's really an important... Secretary at HUD. A secretary at HUD, yes. Um, it's a really, I think, groundbreaking um, initiative because what it's saying is that we have to change the way that we are rebuilding. We can't rebuild exactly what was there before. And there's an opportunity now to sort of think about how you can rebuild in a way that's better, that sort of builds resiliency. But what we're doing with our work is we're trying to not only sort of solve the problems related to climate change, but if you're going to make these kinds of investments, we should make investments that work on the sort of the non-extreme sort of event days. These are investments that work on two levels. On the one hand, to deal with seconds, go ahead. the vulnerability of water, but at the same time, um, our investments into the quality of everyday life in our, the communities in our region. Well, Georgine, this is important stuff, and that's why we, have, we like to have you and your colleagues at NJIT coming on and talking about them, because sometimes it may be hard to follow all the technical terms, mm -hmm. but I will say that what you're talking about matters to all of us. So I want to thank you for joining us. Well, I want to thank you for this opportunity. It's really just a pleasure to be here and a it's great good to honor. Have you. Good thank stuff. you. Stay with us. One on one will continue right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by uh, Joseph Forline, who is Vice President for Customer Solutions at Public Service Electric and Gas Company. Good to see you, Joe. Good to see you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. You're uh, here to talk about a program called Solar for All. We'll have some information up throughout this program, this segment, uh, for people to get more information. Solar for All. 
Where is the solar market these days? I thought it was dying. No, well, solar slowed down a little bit in New Jersey a couple years ago, but it's, it's really come back quite a bit, and nationally the market is just continues to grow. 2013 was a banner year, and in New Jersey we're pretty much back to where we were two years ago. Why, what's happening? What, what's spurred it on? Well, a couple years ago we did some solar legislation in New Jersey to try to uh, increase the demand for solar, and really that ties to the renewable portfolio standard. There's a requirement that all the power- the what? Renewable, boy, see, you're yeah. jargoning on me already. Yeah, so what basically, basically uh, the utility companies have to buy power, uh, and a certain amount of that power has to be from renewable sources. And, uh, and, and the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities uh, sets, some, sets the guidelines around that. And we increased the amount of energy we had to buy from renewable sources, which increased the subsidies and brought the, so, the, the solar program back a little bit in the last couple of years. That's interesting. So I think to myself, is one of the challenges, it's one of the challenges when it comes to solar, you have to have a sunny day? Is it part of the, you know, the today happens to be a day we're taping in the summer. You have to have sun. Because things are sunny. Obviously, yes. You have to have, you have, to have sun. The uh, panels only generate electricity when the sun's out, and that's a big part of it. If you're a homeowner and you're looking to put solar on your roof, you need to, you need to have a sunny roof. Cloudy day, we don't get power. Cloudy day, you don't get power, and that's where uh, the importance of the grid comes in. So the grid, whoa, 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 explain that. Break it down. So if you look at the uh, at PSE and G, we uh, we have the electric grid. We have the the wires that bring the electricity to your home. So if you put a solar system on your house, and the sun goes in, or it's a cloudy day, or at night, you still need electricity. You still need to power your appliances and run your heater and your air conditioner. And to do that, you need to rely on your electric lines that come into your house now. So you're support, you're, you're backing it up. You're backing it up, that's right. The Mom, other- this. Uh, Let me let's, the, the Georgette, put some pictures up here because I, I wanna show some pictures of where solar panels are actually being, actually used, and what, where, where is that? Like, so this is, this is a part of our Solar for All program. And, right. uh, we have solar panels on your utility pole. So if you drive around on the state in New Jersey, you'll see a, a panel, as you see pictured here, on your utility pole. We have 180,000 of them throughout our territory. And that's the largest pole top solar system in the world. It's, uh, we get the panels from a company called Petra Solar in New Jersey. And basically it allows us to take advantage of space on the utility poles to generate electricity for our customers. Where do you put them on top? It's about halfway up the pole. You could, uh, you know, you could see them as you, I'm sure you... you yes, yeah, you, so you put them on the side, what happens? Excuse me? You put them there and... When the sun shines, the, the uh, sunlight is converted to electricity. They're tied directly into our system. That's fascinating. But it's, so you're taking advantage of the fact that you have those poles in place. That is right. And uh, there's 180,000 of them. We have a wireless network that connects them all together so we can determine which are working, which aren't. If there's a if there's a tr if if one of the panels uh, disconnects or if right. we can go out and make a repair. But you know, Joe, the other things that's fascinating about solar, other than the fact that, you know, there actually is a plan in the state of New Jersey to have 22% of uh, New Jersey's, excuse my voice, um, to have 22% of New Jersey's energy come from renewable energy sources by the year 2020. Put that in perspective, and then how does solar fit into renewable energy? Well, solar is solar's a part of it, and uh, New Jersey is a leader in the area of solar. We're the number three state in the nation, believe it or not, a northeast state like New Jersey. And if you go back 15 years ago, go, we had a total of six solar systems in the entire state. Today six. we have Six. Today we have over 25,000 systems. Wow. And, uh, you know, we, we really uh, have policies in the state that promote solar, and PSE&G has been a leader in uh, supporting the state's policies. Talk not about only jobs. do we have our, well, not only do we have our solar for all program, but we also have a solar loan program. Where solar we, loan, what yeah, is that? So we have a solar loan program where uh, we work with uh, contractors throughout the state. If you want a solar system on your home, you'll call up a contractor, you'll get an estimate, and then you call PSE&G and we will provide uh, a loan which will cover about half of the cost of the system. 
you don't have to pay the loan back in dollars. You get to pay it back in SRECs if you choose. SRECs. Which are, SRECs are renewable energy credits, which basically are credits that you can use that go toward the state's uh, targets for the energy master plan. Jobs. Solar creates jobs. We Solar creates a lot of jobs. If you look at the... Uh, you know, various ways to produce energy. Solar probably pre, pre, uh, provides more jobs than any of the others. We, we have about 500 jobs a year that are generated by the PSE&G solar programs. And these are all kinds of jobs, blue collar, white collar, engineers, construction managers, electricians, uh, laborers. It, it, it really is an industry that generates a lot of jobs. And if you think about it, it goes up panel by panel, house by house, system by system. Uh, it, it's really a labor-intensive industry. But in your, in, your, in your company, we've had a long-standing relationship with PSEG, and Ralph LaRosa is not only on with us and Ralph Izzo, but they're on our sister program, NJTV News, on a regular basis, talking about a lot of these issues. I'm curious about this when it comes to solar. Do your people out in the field have to be retrained to do this solar stuff? I mean, how do they know how to do it? Well, we, we use a network of contractors, and we have an internal staff that supports that. So it's your people and outside yeah, people, we use so that's both. where the, the new jobs are. We're generating a lot of jobs. Uh, yes, that's tr that's right. How did, and in your end of it, the customer, your title is actually customer solutions. How is it tied to customer solutions? Well, we, uh, we, we, we take the order. We, we, we put in something called a net meter, which spins backwards so that when... Your, your solar system's producing and you're not using the entire output, you can put power back into the grid. Uh, we process the orders to get people connected. And we also develop the solar loan program. We process the loans. We help to manage the solar all for all program. Customers. All to help customers. And uh, you know, solar is, uh, is something that customers like. Whenever we do a customer survey, uh, they want to know that your, their utility is investing in renewable energy. Well, you're helping people on a regular basis, Joe Furline, PSE&G, good stuff. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by AmeriHealth Caritas, parent company of Perform Care, TD Bank. Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, NJM, Choose New Jersey, and by Community Education Centers. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com, and by Commerce Magazine. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.